seconds. If you don't have it turned in. Anybody else? OK. Um, any questions on this? Bill, I'll have a key posted this afternoon. Um, should be pretty straightforward. Um, and then I'll have another one for this next round posted um, um, on today, too. So homework number two um, will come out today. I don't know what you want to do on the schedule. I'm open to giving you some options. This was my original schedule that I had posted. Um, we're running a little bit behind. The exam will still be here Friday the 20th. This is what uh, the updated schedule is going to look like. So we'll wrap up intermolecular forces, intramolecular forces today. And then um, we'll do atomic orbitals, molecular orbitals, and um, uh, two sets of molecular orbitals uh, into Wednesday of next week. And then um, have a midterm on Friday. So. Do you want another homework? Because I was going to give another homework before the exam. And if we stick to the Wednesday to Wednesday schedule, it would like come out that Wednesday right before the exam. So what I could do is give you homework number three on Monday. So you'd have like two out at the same time. And then have that third one due the Thursday before the exam. So, yes? The material is on the exam. Right? The material is going to be on the exam. No. Who want, and so the uh, one option one is um, due or um, out on um, 16 October. Due, uh, what would that be, 19 October? Option two is out uh, 18 October. And then do whatever that would be, 25 of October. But regardless, this material is going to be on exam three. Yeah. Did you just make them both out earlier, like both come out on the 16th? Um, well, number two is going to come out today. So, I mean, yeah, I could get number three out potentially by Friday. Yes. That would be the 13th. Okay, so option one, option two. Okay, so that's what we'll do. I'll, uh, so then you'll have all three and all three keys for the exam. Um, okay. So what did I say? Out Friday. Thanks. Okay, um, other questions on course, yes? Uh, so there's a two Thursday, and then there's a box in the, what building is the program? Um, SME 343G. Thanks. Um, the answers are going to be posted the same, the 19th, right? Yep. Yep, yep. Did we turn it in in class on the 18th? Yep. Okay. Okay. So today we're fight. We're going to wrap up um, our discussion of Coulomb's law and um, issues related to Coulomb's law. Some of these other forms, um, including ion-dipole interactions, dipole-dipole van der Waals, um, and see how those kind of come together. Um, so. I felt like we rushed this a little bit. I just wanted to be sure there was, this was clear, because this should be very clear in terms of how we got this on this Born-Haber example, right? And this was maybe, um, we, we were rushed there towards the end, right? So we went from solid salt to um, salt to the elemental form, so elemental sodium, elemental chlorine, which is a gas. And then we, were, we went to gaseous sodium, gaseous sodium ion. And then we went with uh, chlorine. We ionized chlorine and then, or excuse me, we atomized chlorine and then we ionized chlorine. And so we had all of these different potential energies, okay? And so by definition, the lattice 
the enthalpy of lattice formation or the, or the lattice dissociation energy is moving from gaseous ions to solid, um, solid salt, <coughs> right? So that's why this, so then we plugged in these numbers at each of these steps that we had, right? And that's why this one was negative. I felt like I heard a large outcry of confusion in terms of why the ionization of chlorine was negative because when we go from gaseous ions in red back to um, our solid salt, that step is negative, right? So we're going against the arrow. The arrow's pointing down because it's a negative number, okay? So here, we're going against it as we make this reaction pathway. So that's why it becomes positive. Here we're going against the arrow, against the arrow, yes? So why was that step put to the side rather than just on top of the You could have done it. You totally could have done it that way. Yep. Partly it's because I ran out of room on my, on my piece of paper. Um, yeah, there's, there's no reason why to put it off to the side. You could have. Well, why is it treated differently than the step on the bottom when they're both pointing down? Because the, um, because you're going against this arrow, and here you're going with this arrow. But isn't that only because we went up because we were to the side? If we put that on top, we have just straight down. Yeah, you're right. Okay, this is not a very good explanation. Um, um, because it's because of the way the ionization is defined. Right, the ionization energy is the energy required to remove an, an electron, which is, oh. right? And we're putting on an electron, so we are As opposed to, doing the opposite of that. That's right. Oh, wait, so it should have been. Because whereas sodium is, is, a, is a, the removal of an electron. There'll be um, another practice on this, on the homework. Can I explain like, why the formation energy is also like minus instead of plus? Formation energy like uh, minus 411 plus. <laughs> because you're going with this, they're going in the same direction as the formation energy. Look at, remember we, I had that slide that defined all of these terms carefully? You've got to look at how those are defined. Okay. Because by definition, the lattice formation energy is written from this way to that way. Or if it was tricky and it said, what's the dissociation energy, you'd have to do it the other. It would be this, the negative of that. Yeah. So if you're looking at the chart that you gave us on the lecture slides and you're going in the reverse step, you just do the... Opposite. That's, they just change the sign. Okay. Yep. Yep. Um, so why is... Um, Delta H of formation is just like in the solar equation negative, but uh, delta H of ion is Because of the way that the ionization, enthalpy of ionization is defined. Okay. Enthalpy of ionization is defined as um, adding an electron. Let's just pull up this, this slide. So it's actually favorable to add an electron to neutral chlorine. So that's why we have a positive. It would really be a plus in that area. So the enthalpy of ionization is written as moving from gaseous to a positive, one electron is removed from each atom in a mole of gaseous atoms, right? So that's how our enthalpy of ionization is defined. So what we're doing to chlorine is we're adding an electron, right? Yeah. So because we're doing the opposite, essentially we could have drawn the arrow the other way. Sure. Um, and then we could have consistently gone down the table. Sure. Yep. <coughs> 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 <coughs>
okay? Pra deal, just practice these, these should become more clear. Okay. Uh, lecture six, no, we are on lecture six. So if this is, so is this a stable thing then? Right, and it's not just stable, it's, that's a lot, right? Negative 800 kilojoules per mole. So sodium and chloride really like being together, right? And then we calculated it through this other method. We estimated it through this, this modified Coulomb's approach and got about uh, negative 750, which is still a lot. Yes? So is the born Haber cycle more accurate when it comes to calculating this? Mm, I don't know that. <coughs> it probably de it depends on what your salt is, okay. right? If, because there's air associated with all of these and that can be a what do you think would affect the air, the measurement air of those? Hmm? Yeah, it's just, it's just hard to measure it overall, so. Yeah, but why would some be harder than others? Why would maybe there be more, why would there be more air associated with the atomization of energy of chlorine versus the atomization energy of iodine? Reactivity or the purity of the starting products that you'd be able to have, right? So um, there could be more. Um, certain salts tend to really want to have other counter ions, okay. right? So there's, there's. So I don't think you can draw any broad conclusions about which one's more accurate. So that's a lot of energy, but you know from common experience that it's really easy to dissolve sodium chloride, right? I can put it in water. So why do you think that is? If this is such a strong interaction? Um, does sodium or chlorine form a hydrogen bond? No. Yes? Because of the polarity of the water molecule. Okay, and what about that? Um, <coughs> Since this is ionic, it would attract to the opposite charge of the polar side. Sure, and? So like once the ions leave the crystal, they get like form a solvated shell around the ions, and that's lower energy than it would be. What kind of, what kind of energy? Tease that out. Okay. Tease that out a little bit more. What kind, lower energy in terms of? In terms of entropy. Uh, Somebody said it. Entropy, entropy right? And so if you look at the entropy of this solvated system, it's much, much bigger, right? So when you plug that uh, positive enthalpy value into your Gibbs free energy expression, the, this solvation process ends up still being negative. So that's why you push it towards. So it, it, yeah, you're right. It's energetically favored, um, but it's specifically because of the entropy is increasing so dramatically in this random system. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about, like, for example, this kind of interaction. So this would be what's known as an ion-dipole interaction, uh, because you have, you have an ion and you have a dipole. Um, other examples of ion-dipole, something like hemoglobin is an ion-dipole. Um, these are definitely weaker than ion-ion interactions, um, but there's, these are still pretty strong, right? 50 to 100 kilojoules, um, so on par with a covalent bond. Um, so when we start to think about these mathematically, we need to remember the dipole moment, which we've seen before. Um, excuse me, we've seen dipoles I don't, and dipole strength. I don't know that we've explicitly talked about the dipole moment. A dipole moment is uh, just a function of the charge and the distance between these charges. Um, so the, the length um, of those positive and negative regions. And the units of Debye, and one Debye is 3.3 times 10 to the negative 30th Coulomb meters, okay? And so you know this by now, what's, what's polar and nonpolar. Um, so if we think about a metal center and some uh, polar, some dipole coming towards it, which one of these do you think has more energy or is more attractive? Uh, 
left, this one, or this one? Right. Your right, right? Because this is completely aligned, right? If we have something like this, where it's at some angle theta, you start to add in these repulsive forces, right? Because this positive end is slightly closer to the metal center than in this situation, okay? So, oh, I was gonna draw this. I'm, today's PowerPoint heavy, um, so we could get through it, but I think I was gonna do this one. So the energy for an ion dipole, which is in your book, is this expression over Okay, so where here Z is the charge of your ion, so in this case it would be, oops, we don't have a case there anymore. For magnesium it would be two, yep, for sodium it would be one. E is just your, your negative, your charge of an electron. This is your um, dipole moment. Okay, so a f an expression that describes the relative uh, <coughs> polarity of your, of your dipole. Again, in units of coulombs times meters. Theta is right, is defined there. The angle of interaction. And all of this we've defined previously. So just a slightly modified version, yeah. Oh, that's just a plane to, to illustrate kind, kind of what, where this theta would be. So um, a plane that's, is the right word, tangential to the surface of the sphere? So if it's a sphere, why would it make any difference where it's like coming in? Unless it's, a, is that one perpendicular and then that's at center and not perpendicular? Maybe that's better word choice is perpendicular. Okay. Yeah. Because with a sphere, like, because you could have a, a dipole that lays completely flat on a sphere, right? Or one that's perfectly at 90 degrees. Okay, so it's just not perpendicular. Yeah, tangential plane is, pr I shouldn't have said that. Um, yeah, it's the perpendicular nature of this. How perpendicular is this to the surface? Yeah, yeah. I just think the confusion comes from, our drawing looks like if we, if we follow the line of action at the dipole moment, it almost goes exactly to the center. So I think if that well, angle indicator was on the same level as the other one here, it would be more clear. It's kind of a skew line, like a chord through the circle. Okay. Yeah. Um, you're, yeah, the, I, I could redraw this. I, I worry, yeah, I think what you want to worry is the, the angle with which the dipole approaches the center of the sphere. Yeah. Okay. Um, so then, and then, so then mathematically, this should also make sense that where this is highest is again where cosine theta is one, right? Which is 90 degrees. Okay. So what if you had uh, two dipoles, right? Same thing. Attractive, repulsive, somewhere in between, right? Um, so here we need to start considering not only the dipole moment of each, of each molecule, right? Previously we were looking at just the, the dipole, we only had one dipole, so that's all we had to deal with. This was considering our, um, our other charge. Um, Again, the distance, but also the orientation of both molecules. So this, I just did screenshots out of the book um, to save time, but that's what the expression starts to look like for dipole-dipole interactions, okay? So here you have the um, dipole moment of A and B, the um, denominator's the same, and then we have to consider the, all th three different orientations, right? So 
here's our negative end, here's our positive end. So theta A, as this rotates in the plane, theta B, <laughs> as that rotates in the plane, but also this phi, as they rotate this way, in and out of the board. Uh, right? Is theta A and theta B the same rotation, essentially? They seem to be like on the same plane of rotation. Um, yeah, I think the way this is drawn, by, by definition, wait, say that again? Like, shouldn't theta A like be rotating like this, and then phi like this, and then... This is probably a, considering one of them to be locked in place, right, for this phi to be, or else you would, you would have, well, no, that's not true, because they could both rotate and you would have yeah. this... Okay. Um, because they could both be rotated some, yeah, you're right, so they could both be rotated some degree, but that would just be, one, again, an angle. Yeah, so does that cancel out then, if you do the math that way? Um, cosine. I think it's the rotation with each plane, like the x, y, the, um, z, x, and z, y, isn't it? So if you think about it, it's like, the rotation here, the rotation here, and then the rotation. Yeah, there should be like threefold rotation like Yeah, threefold rotation. Mm, you're looking at how they're aligned in, in, the, in the board and then, um, or in the plane of the board and then going into the board, right? So we don't have any y-axis rotation like this here. <laughs> yeah. Not with these kind of, I mean, you would with a more complicated molecule, right? But this is, these are these are planar molecules. This is the, at least um, this molecule is planar. So like this expression changes if you have like that pyramidal like, like, Yeah. Structure. Yeah. Couldn't, couldn't two planar molecules easily rotate really up with respect to each other? Yeah. Yeah, and when you're yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like a fire and theta, it's not like a third angle. Even if it's three D. Yeah. Um Okay, we're gonna we're gonna have to skip this um, for purposes of time, um, but yeah, no, it makes sense. You're looking at how how are the dipoles arranged in two di in two dimensions, right? Um, for this kind of molecule. So, if they are perfectly aligned, then it reduces to something like this, okay? Um, and by perfectly aligned, I mean when the theta is zero and they're perfectly aligned. Yes. So, is um, are the theta the rotation of the dipole or, or of the molecule? Well, it should be the same thing. Well, because then if it's you wouldn't have a rotation of the dipole in this direction if you're playing in the y direction. So that's why. So you're saying, yeah, if this is if this rotates and it is perfectly planar, the dipole isn't changing. Yeah, you're right. That's a great point. The dipole is just single vector. Yeah. Yeah. My hunch is that I didn't derive this equation, so um, I can't speak to its validity at length, but my suspicion is this is the most generalized version that, you, that is out there. And that for each kind, to truly do this justice, you would have to consider the geometry of each molecule. So, a clarifying point, what Christian was saying, since we're considering our dipoles just a single vector, let's say from the C to the O and the carbonyl. Yeah. Um, is this, in general, only useful for dipoles that we can reduce to a single vector? Like we can't talk about aggregated dipoles all over a molecule. We um, have to just sum them up and treat them. I mean, dipoles in general, even over the course of an entire molecule, you look at the, you, the sum of all of those individual dipoles. So it's a reduced dipole across the entire molecule. I think the R cube term should indicate that it has to have the, the rotation of that y-axis too, because if it, if it truly was in the 2D plane, it should be in R, R squared. Yeah, it definitely makes sense that if you had a different, a something that wasn't as planar as this molecule, that, that you would need to consider that as well. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, of course, hydrogen bonds are just a particularly strong form of, of this. Um, have you seen, did we, we didn't talk about this kind of data before. Did we? But I had to pull these numbers up. If you just have H2O, H2S, H2SE, H2TE, how do the boiling points change, right? And so something like dihydrogen selenide 
has a really, really low boiling point. Dihydrogen sulfide has a, like, right, that's a gas. So you have to get all the way down to polonium before you start to have a boiling point that's at room temperature relative to water. So that's all due to hydrogen bonds. Isn't that amazing? Why does the trend go like this? Because this is from hydrogen bonds. So you're, you're, there is, this is a, I mean, these are all a, one trend, right? You're going from negative to positive. And water's just the outlier. Yeah, right. This is all these these four are all due to the the essentially the weight of this species. Yeah. Is that just because of oxygen being very electronegative? Yeah, right? That's why this is so this the distance between this is so big because only because of hydrogen bonds. Wow. <laughs> okay, and again, it's just because of this electronegativity of oxygen that's so much higher than all these other guys. Okay. Um, bond length, um, you should have a general idea of the bond lengths. Um, definitely of bonding energies for these different kinds of, of forces, but um, have a, have start to have a notion that hydrogen bonds can be longer, uh, you know, two to four angstroms, whereas covalent bonds are less than two angstroms. Okay. Um, do, 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 do. So roughly, what, what are the hydrogen bonds? Um, bond strength, 4 to 50 for, for dipoles in general, dipole-dipole interactions. And then water-hydrogen bonds um, are about are 20 kilojoules per mole. So that's still not that much, right? 20 kilojoules per mole relative to like an ionic, ionic interaction. So how, how is it changing it that much? Because it's not just one molecule, it's a bunch of Yeah, right? Because you're getting this essentially, it's, not, it's never really like this, right? You have these, it's, uh, this mesh of water molecules that are all holding each other together. Okay. Um, so now we're moving to... Um, Van der Waals forces, okay? And so these are subcategorized. So these are the, the next level down in terms of levels of weakness, okay? Things that are weaker. Um, and there's three kinds. Um, Kisom, which are permanent dipole interactions, which are very closely related to the dipole-dipole interactions we were just talking about. Gets a little confusing. Um, it, it um, yeah, Dubai, which are an induced dipole, and a dispersion forces, which are transient dipole, okay? So these are attractive forces, and these can be very long range, right? Up to 10 nanometers. Um, so for some alkanes, very long alkanes, we can have really, really long um, interactions between molecules, and we'll look at some data about that, okay? <coughs> So this, I, this was the best thing that I could find to explain these. So these Kisom, a subtype of van der Waals forces, are again the same thing that we saw before where we're interacting between two, two dipoles, okay? Um, a Debye interaction is where one dipole induces a dipole in a non, a system that doesn't have a dipole. And then these London or dispersion forces um, are between two things that do not have dipoles, but just due to, uh, due to interactions between the electrons on A and the nucleus of B, you can get these induced uh, dipoles, okay? <coughs> so here are the expressions. I don't even think I used to put a homework on this, um, so I Definitely doubt that this will be on the exam, but um, I did want you to appreciate the, how these are in a way an extension of Coulomb's law. So this, this key sum force um, is a function again of the dipole moments. The main difference here is that we bring in um, temperature. So let's talk about this one a little bit more. Yeah. Um, like geometrically, like where did the arc of the sixth term come from? It doesn't really make um, I'm going to have to get back to you on that. I don't know. 
equations. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't. I for just for time, I had to pull these out. Yeah. Yeah, the units, I mean, the units definitely work out because these are, you're going to have coulombs to the fourth, meters to the fourth, Boltzmann's, that's Newton squared, and then six meters on the bottom. Um, but in an abstract term, why is it to the sixth? Yeah, I'm going to gonna have to get back to you. Um, so how, how is that, when, like, what's the deal with this expression relative to the one that we just looked at, right? So when would you use this dipole-dipole interaction relative to this expression that I just showed you? So the difference is that the first one, we were looking at one molecule interacting with one other molecule, right, with a fixed angle. So that's a, a very unique case. What this expression is talking about is the bulk, <coughs> right? So here, there is no longer a theta or a phi because you're looking at an entire, you're not looking at two water molecules, you're looking at an entire pot of water, okay? And so that's, so we, we need to consider temperature because as you put in more thermal energy, you can change the permanent dipoles, the direction of the dipoles, right? And therefore you can change the amount of um, attractive forces. Right, and that's why eventually, and then you, that, those forces can go to zero, and you can boil your water or boil whatever you want to boil, okay? Um, this is just showing, this is showing it in the same way, that, um, to, just to illustrate the difference in um, alignment. So this, this bottom expression that we just put in is it's a free rotation. Okay, so then this Debye interaction um, is, kind of intuitive that something like um, something like oxygen molecule that is inherently nonpolar can interact with something that is polar and it can pull its electrons over to one side and induce a dipole okay so when we induce a dipole um, we need to add an additional term um, which is the polarizability so how, and that these, are, these would be tabulated, um, how polarizable is, is one species. Um, so, um, yes, interaction is, in, yes, yeah, so we're independent of temperature here because the, um, these are r relatively short interactions. And so um, the, yeah. That's why we're not, if we're not influenced by temperature. <coughs> and then the last one is these Lo the London dispersion forces. So here there's no permanent dipole required, um, and it's a based on the uh, attraction of the electrons by one molecule for the nucleus of another. And so it's generally a function of the number of electrons and the number of protons. So if you have more, if you have stronger forces to begin with, you have a greater potential of uh, having an interaction. So this is some data where uh, this is the melting point, the boiling point of different alkanes and the melting point of different alkanes. Okay, so methane, butane, propane, eth or ethane, propane, butane, so on and uh, down the line. And what, so what kind of forces would you have here? Which of the three, I mean, it's, it's, I'm putting it in the title, right? But the only thing you have is that last one, right? There's no, there's no dipole here. There's no, there's nothing except for this force, right? Yes. Um, isn't it, from what I understand, is that all three forces are applicable to anything. It's just the, the percent of what it is. Like, there is a dipole, it's just not that much. Sure. I mean, it's, um, when you say that, it's like inaccurate. Yeah. Um, I mean, this has a, does it have a dipole? Um, mm, like, something like carbon tetra, like ethane? 
it's hard to see how that has a dipole, right? Maybe you can argue that at some, at some level it does, but if it's completely nonpolar, right, how does, so you're, I mean, you, if you're saying it's a non-zero number, okay, maybe, yeah. But isn't the, like, when you look at the tetrahedral structure of an octane, the dipoles cancel out? Yeah. So yeah, so you may, I mean, you're going to have dipoles in this, between this carbon and that hydrogen, right? There's some unequal sharing of those electrons. <coughs> but the molecule as a whole, yeah, it cancel out is probably a good word choice, yeah. No, totally. This is just, I mean, neither one of them are, right? This is just to illustrate. So this would be, I forget, I guess that's 11, an 11-carbon 11 chain. Um, yeah, yeah. Just a nomenclature, yeah. One dispersion is just from, like, the random movement of electrons. Why does it result in an overall attractive force? So you're saying why, why would it not be an, a repulsive force? <sighs> Um, <laughs> that's a good question, um, because you could imagine that it would just um, balance out. So I can say that these are, this is by far the weakest force out of all of them. They're way less, it's like two to three kilojoules per mole. Um, so on balance, you probably are, you probably do have some repulsive forces as well as some attractive forces. Um, but why the balance skews towards an attractive force? Mm, yeah, I'm gonna have to think about that. Yeah. So why do the melting point and boiling points reach a saturation level? I thought as you increase the number of carbons, number of electrons just increase linearly. Um, the plateau effect. Because um, do 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 do. So this is now at like room temperature. Um. Why doesn't this increase infinitely? The carbon you add is going to add less significant difference from the previous chain. Yeah, so. that's a good point. So that like the effect of one additional carbon, instead of being 50%, is becoming 10% and eventually becomes, what are we down here? A third, or th 3%. Um, you also probably have to consider packing geometry and that at, when these things start to become really big, the the affinity that they have for each other starts to become a much a, a very significant force as well right so the what are the what are the so more carbons more energy so more carbons more energy to melt or boil yes no inherent dipoles if you have a bigger molecule you have more van der waals forces so what are the th the three issues here first of all if you're bigger you just have more mass it takes more energy to to boil but as you also have a bigger area, you have more surface area between these two to interact and a more chance that these electrons would form these temporary dipoles, okay? So kind of going back to that is this notion of packing. So if you look at these, see how this is almost like a step function here at the beginning? And that's because these even, the even numbered carbons pack tighter than odd numbers do. And so that's why you see this step function at the beginning that starts to even out at higher numbers. But um, I think the right answer is that you just start, the, the stability from the packing starts to overcome everything else, yeah. Why is there some dip at like three carbons? Um, I doubt that, I don't know if that's real or not. If propane is really, is propane, I'll have to look it up if propane's really lower than ethane. Um, but if, if there is, my, my suspicion is that it's just because of the shape of propane, where ethane is slightly more stable, and butane um, has more better packing density. But that three carbon number is throw, uh, somehow throwing it off. But if, I don't know if that's really real. Yeah. OK. So um, as I think somebody mentioned, these, these forces are additive. And so people um, will can have uh, summarized these into uh, 
just a, you can, you can of course condense these into a single term and put these all over <coughs> r to the sixth. That's really bugging me that I don't have a good answer for why that's r, r to the sixth. I'll definitely do that uh, next week, or Friday. Um, and I'm sure you've seen, you've probably seen gecko stuff before, right? So that's, the, that's what geckos do, right? Is this is all, these are all uh, van der Waals forces, right? And you've probably seen th these images before of how they do it, um, where you have these uh, little arrays of setae and made of individual seta, and in that is a spatulae. And so the point is that you get a lot of surface area, right? These things, um, you have 5,000 of these per cubic millimeter, and but each individual 10 nanometer spatulae is 10 to the negative seventh, but it's just a, a scaling issue because you have so many of these. Um, this is a paper that I think I'm going to skip. Um, but it's where these, how do you measure this? Did you, did you ever wonder, like, how do you measure that each spatulae is 10 to the negative seventh newton? So this is a paper where they, you rip off the gecko toe and you scrape the setae and you glue it onto a pin and then you use this piezo cantilever and then you apply a force and then you rip it off. And so here's their electron. So there's their little MEM sensor, right? Like somebody studies this, they've probably got a, a grant to study this. Um, and so you push it down and then you pull it back off, right? So here it is in cross section. So you're pushing this, this flat little pancake thing on and then you're pulling it back off. And so this is time. So here they are uh, preloading, they're pushing and then they're gonna pull back and at some point it breaks, right? And so this is their, their loading curve. And so they can look at that force difference to see how strongly did it stick to their substrate. And then they could plot the, uh, the, the force right before it starts to slide relative to the, the loading force, okay? This was their control where they had it flipped the other way, right? Um, oh yeah, and so do you know how they get off? Like how do these things ever move? What keeps them from being glued in place? Right? Because the Van Rolls were <coughs> too weak to determine. No, it's that they, they, cur they change the angle. They change that angle of attraction. So this is them pulling their toes like all the way back like that. So by changing the angle, you reduce that force. Okay, that was just an aside. Um, also be aware of hydrophobic forces. Um, hydrophobic forces um, are incredibly strong um, and incredibly powerful, right? So this is your, a classic um, molecule that's used to make micelles. And so you've probably seen this where these forces will stick together. These ends of the molecules will stick together and these will go on their own. And so you can start to make liposomes or micelles, okay. Um, so let's just wrap up with these Leonard Jones plots. So um, obviously the overall force between two species is a combination of their attractive and repulsive forces. Um, and you're in equilibrium when these are balanced, okay? So um, the, what are the, re the, the repulsive forces can kind of be summarized by um, the, these are the repulsive forces between the non-bonding electrons on your molecule, right? You've got, you've got these valence electrons that are not involved in forming a bond. They're going to repulse each other no matter what, okay? Um, and this, and I'll, we'll, we'll touch on this next week in terms of why this is a, to the 12th power, but the repulsive force scales the inverse of the 12th power and the attractive force based on the van der Waals scales on the inverse of the sixth power, okay? Uh, why did they choose the axes unit to be the way they are? The axes units, R is distance, and because you're, that's what the, this is, how does the energy change as a function of distance, oh, is what okay. this is plotting, okay. so right? The vertical axis is energy density? Um, Poten think about it as potential energy, yeah. The potential energy between these two species. Um, 
And so it makes sense if these are both infinitely far apart, you have neither attractive nor repulsive forces, right? And if they're infinitely close together, you're going to have infinite repulsive forces, right? And so when you add the repulsive and the attractive forces, you get this plot that's in, blue, or in um, red that can be simplified by this expression, okay? And so um, here, V is the potential between two molecules. Um, this epsilon is what's known as the well depth. That's, so if you had a deeper well depth, you would have more attraction between these two species, okay? Um, choo -choo 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 -choo. This sigma is the distance. So the sigma is a constant up here, right? The R is what's changing to make your plot. The sigma is the distance when the potential is zero, which is also known as the van der Waals radius, okay? When that, and that kind of makes sense. When your van der Waals forces are equal to the repulsive forces, you're, you have what's known as the van der Waals radius, and the potential then is zero, right? Because your attractive and repulsive forces are completely balanced, okay? And then R is your x-axis, okay? And this value here, sometimes people plot as the, the, the radius at minimal energy. Yes? So would epsilon be the energy to like hold the module apart? Mm, I don't think about it. No, definitely not. Um, it's the, the maybe if it's, no, because you can't plot it to infinity. Um, mm, let me sit on that one too. Yeah. Um, okay, so We'll, we'll revisit a few of these three issues um, next week when we, or Friday, when we move on to atomic orbitals. Um, and those two homeworks will go out this week. And I'll see you Friday. Yep. Uh, no, it'll be Thursday like it regularly is. But I'll.